one of my joys of my part of the business is talking to the artists and learning about their inspirations and getting to know them and seeing them come through in their art. Um, I love that Helen has a joyousness in her work. Um, I love watching people go around and smile when they see the curious things they find inside. Um, and I really found uh, Helen's artist statement on life's content very pertinent for the moment. So I just read you a few pieces out of that because I think it's a great statement um, and the paintings so reflect that to me. So I'm hoping you see that in them too. Um, what life's contents? What have our lives become? The new guiding principle, the internet of things, has whipped up a frenzied world of emotionally charged lunatic ideas through indignant holograms and magic tricks, mostly delivered via social media. We can barely make out what is real in our lives or who is to believe. Um, and then it's getting harder to dodge the nonsense of these unrobotic times. With all the panic and chaos it can create through thin air so quickly, but if you turn it off, it just stops. I believe we need to fight with all our human will to remain firmly in charge of being human. Helen's not joking. I, I agree with her in full. Being recal recalcitrant and earthy, living essential life is important in the face of the current nonsense that has gripped the world. Eat well, walk, run, love, laugh, paint, write, kiss the dog on the face, <laughs> sleep with your cat, <laughs> real re re read real paper books, Grow veggies and chooks, eat meat if you want, and burn wood in a fireplace. Yeah. With your phone turned off, insert it in a Ziploc bag buried in the freezer. Yep, it's sure. just given me a good idea. <laughs> I know so, all about it. in terms of that, I think with the phone buried in the freezer, I can stop and spend not just a fleeting look at these, to find the intrigue in there as well. And that's why I love Helen's art. It gives forever. Every time you walk past it, you just notice something else or a conversation or um, an expression on an animal's face or striped cows and spotted <laughs> cows. Um, so yes, I hope you all enjoy it as much as I do. Thank you, Helen. Thank you. Um, look, I just what I need to do this because I forget to do nice things. And I, I do. Um, <laughs> thank you to the JROC team. Um, I, they're the most integral uh, gallery that I've ever worked with, and I've worked with a lot. And I have no fear working with these, this mob. Um, they pay. <laughs> they tell me the truth. They hang my work beautifully, and they do me a great service as an artist. So thank you Thanks. from the bottom of my heart. <laughs> I'm not really that easy to work with. <laughs> anyway, that's because I don't like the bullshit. But I don't get any from uh, this team, so it's fabulous. Okay. Um, look, I've written some stuff, so I don't want to bore you, but I've got, I've got a little treat I want to share with you. So just let me fumble through. I'll ad lib a bit, read a bit, and I want to get to the main uh, menu in a minute. So. Um, I had an interview with an ABC, um, a lovely young chap from the ABC earlier on, and he asked me a lot of these questions. He sort of said, what motivates you as an artist? And I thought, oh, far out. You know, 35 years painting, it's like, oh, you know, life. <laughs> um, so, but I'm gonna just read a couple of things out. So what goes on behind the easel? And what, you know, what drives me to even bother? And I'm talking about, like, artists are all different, so indulge me. I've had many moments where I've actually just had enough and I don't want to do it anymore. You know, I love writing and just, you know, digging in the garden and just doing earthy things. But what happens when I uh, give it up is there's an intervention from something that's not obvious or logical or real that gets me back on track. And I'm going to tell you about it, or one of these instances. 
I, I'm a big picture person. That's sort of how I came out. I'm an ideas factory. That's quite fortunate as an artist, as you can imagine. <laughs> it's just my nature. My big picture re really is all of it, right? That really means big picture. And that includes information from the unconscious, which seems out of my control, as well as global events, which also seem out of my control. I'm just the middle man. Then, after taking all of this on, I've got to get up each day and reconcile what those contents are that come to me in my dreams and, you know, inner thoughts, as well as reading the news. I, I'm an addict. That's why I can say things like, put your phone in the freezer. Because, you know, I'm just trying to kick the habit. <laughs> so, I'm sitting in front or standing in front of my easel every day and that's what's actually going on. That's the traffic, that's, that's the argument, that's the discussion that's going on. I'm always looking for got it. I'm looking for got it. And because, you know, when you, be, as you get a bit older, you just, you can't not be who you are. You have to be who you are and the search never ends. So there's no ordinary day in the studio. It's a process I, I actually really concentrate on, not just what's going on inside and outside, but the actual process of how I'm actually going to wrestle it into something that I can deliver on the walls. When I was in my 40s, I took my questions about that process of bringing the two things together and, and you know, the intrigue of the inner and the outer worlds seriously enough to do a master's degree in Jungian psychology. And because I'm an obsessive nut job, I also decided I'm going to be a Jungian analyst. So I took on the precursor training, which is a two year, uh, basically a two year dream analysis. So you're on the couch with a, not necessarily with the Jungian analyst, but it was quite nice. But in this case, we were actually on the phone. And you, 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 no, he didn't, he, stop it. <laughs> you. Um, but um, it, what you actually do is you, you record your dreams every night. Like in the middle of the night, I had a recorder and it's like, oh, the elephant on top of the egg. You know, and you literally, it doesn't matter how much nonsense it sounds like, or you get up and you scratch it in. So, you know, there's a lot of uh, sleepless nights because it becomes quite uh, obsessive because of the contents that start to come out. It's not like, you know, having a random dream. Oh, that was a funny dream. You're literally, and uh, the key part about this is you then take that material and you interact with it. So you know how you have a really amazing dream and then you go and say, go and tell your partner or whoever and say, oh, I had this really great dream. I ring up my friend Ingrid Windham. Oh, I had this amazing dream. I'm going to tell it to you. Oh, I'm busy. No, too bad. Wait. <laughs> and, and <laughs> stay. And so, <laughs> I'm not a dog. And it's, <laughs> wait. <laughs> so I, I will I will punch that dream back if James, my son's there, or Cass is there, it doesn't matter. I'll, I have to interact with it. It's like a, I, I can't live without, and if no one's there, I hit the typewriter, and I type it out as fast as I can, and I, the key is you've got to put it out there as it feels, right? You don't try and dress it up. So what you're doing is you're taking Part of the masters was also that to put me in touch with the ancient texts and scriptures, you know, so you're going and you're looking at, you know, all of the, uh, the originating spiritual texts from the Bible, you know, the whole lot, everything. You're just looking through all of them and you start to pick up the patterns of the human psyche and how it, it's very similar going back into ancient history to what we're experiencing now. When you overlay your dream content, you start to see these patterns and you suddenly feel like you're not alone. You're talking with 7,000-year-old saints and they're having the same experiences as you're having. So then you start to understand the genius and the pulse of nature bumbling through you. You're just this person walking along, you know, about to have your brekkie and you've been having this discussion in your inner world that resembles someone like St. John of the Cross. And everyone has this capacity. It's not special to have it. It's just that when you interact, when you bring those two things together, it's like a sacred union. 
the unconscious and your knowledge, which is logos, you know, the knowledge of the great knowledge, the great academic knowledge, not the crap that we get delivered these days in universities, etc. The proper knowledge of things that concerned men before they were tweeting. <laughs> now, okay, and why do you do that? Ah, oh, well, I can't help it, it just happens. And because I'm a storyteller and I've always been since I was a little girl, but I've got something to tell you. Now, it was, it was the other day, um, okay, first of all, let me say this. Has there ever been a time in our history, this is the first, where our faith in nature has been tested or put on trial as it has over the last year or so. Hear that? The, our faith in nature. It's been put on trials. We're being, I don't know who it is, but we're getting, a, like I'm talking Bill Gates, not God, but maybe it's God, and I think Gates wants to be God, <laughs> and so on. But, oh, um, and that's where the trouble is. But. When have we actually had to really ask ourselves what is going on? Is this real, right? How do you find meaning in that? Well, I want to share something with you. On the 5th of June, 2019, right? I had this dream and I actually wrote it down exactly as I'm gonna, I, I won't bore you, I promise. <laughs> I won't bore you. And it was, and I found out recently, just yesterday actually, that they reckon the Wuhan flu came out of the, they actually released that, oh, what did, what did we go, gain of function, whatever it was, whatever happened, it was, it started in August 2019. So this was a couple of months prior to that. And I didn't know about it, I'm just a girl. So I had this dream and I want to share it with you. Okay, it's a full story and I didn't know and I just picked it up the other day and I thought, oh, now I think I know what that means. So, and I shared this with my analyst, I shared it with Ingrid, who's my other analyst, she's my <laughs> best friend, so she's my analyst. Here it goes. The earth cracked open, is the dream. A deep boom shook the ground. I fell over and the earth tore apart. It had cracked open. From within a deep black gash, a grey elephant clambered out over the rubble and behind him followed a small red horse. Many other animals tailed, too many for me to name, and they scattered across the split and fissured fields. The mother, there was the mother, it was a mother, lay wretched and helpless. She was tied down. Two men in white coats were poking and prodding her swollen pregnant belly with instruments. Her face was ashen. She was powerless and vulnerable at their mercy and they had none. They tore and twisted at her organs as if they were electrical cables. They stripped her wires and twirled them together recklessly in configurations that were not right. Positives and negatives were ignored. The rules of nature lay in their waste trays. They could not see her beauty. They were devoid of compassion and care. They wanted to control her and what lived and died within her. They were so far gone in their crazy plan, they could not perceive her pain. They had decided for everyone's good, they were the ones that chose who and what lived and died, not her. She was weak. I was full of fear. Now remember, I'm just reading you as I wrote it that morning. I hated these men. I would kill them given half a chance. I would cut their throats and throw their bodies in my septic tank. <laughs> the elephant raged and thundered across the plain, screaming and trumpeting, trumpeting, the small red horse galloping behind. I saw the elephant coming and I ran away. He was enormous and he was mad. He came closer and suddenly he changed form. He became small, the size of a large dog. He came closer to me and then he changed again, large, grey, wrinkled. I ran to my house, I tried to lock the doors and windows, but he was too smart. He kept ahead of my efforts and beat me to the last door. He pushed his great head through and then his body. All of him stood in my kitchen, an elephant standing in my kitchen. I realized my fear was not going to stop him. He came near to me, wild and fierce. I saw my old cat scurrying into a hiding place and I was worried about her. 
I grabbed the sheepskin and I offered it to the elephant, as you do. <laughs> what else are you going to do? <laughs> he stopped and lowered his head. I placed it at his feet. He placed his trunk on the skin and he was gentled by my gesture. Now, I had to leave at this point as the mother was on my mind. I went to where she would be sleeping when she was returned. There was a high platform suspended in tall trees. It was very rustic and rough. I could not help her with those men who would do their bidding. So I had to do something for her, for when she came home to try and make it better for her. I climbed the stairs and tended her bed on the floor. It was all I could do to help, to try and make her comfortable in her terrible state of torture and repression. I knew there was something wrong, it was all wrong. Up was down and down was up. I smoothed the bedding, patted it down. Her bed oddly tilted downwards, her feet pointed downwards. It was not right. I could not fix it. She would not be comfortable with my effort. She would suffer and I could not change that. It would happen, but I had to leave. I climbed down from the platform. The stairs were made of massive and rough cut ancient jarrah. There was a horrible swaying. I stepped down and back, looking back, the stairs had come adrift from the platform. If the stairway was lost, there was no way of her getting home. She would be cut off even from her own place of rest. This is hopeless. I scurried away, trying to find a way to help. Nothing could be done. I couldn't find the right screws or the right drill. Someone was making it hard for me. Very pragmatic. I, then what happened? I knew I needed to do something about the earth splitting open. Oh, you know, fix it. <laughs> I had to stop it. <laughs> I didn't know what I was to do, but I walked along the edge of the great crevice or the fissure with a sense of duty to the task. Then the gash turned into a fast flowing river and further up a magnificent waterfall had formed. I stood marvelling at the birds and life that had miraculously sprung up and was growing at a rapid speed around this new formation. Rivers had changed courses and the changes were not bad. The disaster was okay, it was good. Nature had adjusted and reinvented herself. She was okay, she had healed herself. She had recouped, she didn't need my help. I was worrying over nothing. I stood at the waterfall, watching in awe. I worried that if I went on to stop the stop the changes caused by the disaster using my force, my own powers, I might hurt all the animals and the new life that had emanated from it. Men worry needlessly. That was the dream. Thank you for being patient and listening to it, and I hope it didn't bore you. That was a full dream. So that's the sort of thing that motivates me, is those sort of dreams. And in fact, one of the paintings here when I first did it, I painted that dream, but I changed it because it didn't translate well. So, yeah, there you go. I want to ask you if you've got any questions because I've been blabbing on for ages. <laughs> yes? Um, I was watching you gesticulate while you were talking. Oh, yes, a bit of it. And yeah. that led me to think about how you, how you translated your dance moves into the wonderful sort of trees. Oh, the curly trees. Did you use a mirror? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you know, you, we discussed earlier, we had a lovely chat about um, how, you, you know, you were both looking at the, the way the trees, you know, the curlies, the curly whirly, and, and we were discussing how um, if you really look at nature, you, and, and you can see it in your veins, you know, in a heart system, um, in the endocrine system, if you see it suspended, you know, there's this repeat of the patterns of nature and they just go through everything. I mean, we all know that, you know, you get on an aeroplane, you see the riverways. So I guess what, what was coming through in this was that you can trust nature, she'll heal herself. My view was when I reread this the other day, exactly two years to today it was that I had that dream, that there was this mangling going on in nature. And as it turns out, whether you believe it or not, um, it looks like the, the, the dreaded thing was mangled with and it was uh, developed deliberately, the, the disease. We can't speak the word. <laughs> so, so I get motivated by 
I'm, uh, look, I'm an outward, I'm an extrovert, and as you probably don't notice, but I, <laughs> I get motivated by things I, you know, that are going on in the world. Even when I was a little girl, nuclear war was the problem I had, and I didn't trust any adults because I knew that there was no one in charge that had any good motivations. So I don't trust authorities or any, um, you know, they, they've just done their dash with me. <laughs> So yeah, so yeah, tr I trust nature. When I when I left home at sixteen, I, I was born and raised in Melbourne city. I went to the outback and I spent ten years in the desert, and I was disenchanted when I left Melbourne with that same feeling I just described. And when I went out to the desert and nearly died a couple of times through stupid stupidity, I learned that this was the boss I wanted, nature, because she didn't suffer any fools. And if I did stupid things, they were logical things that I could sort out. But, you know, there was no bias. It's like, you stuff up, you die. <laughs> yeah. That's it. And I can do, and animals are nice and clean like that as well. Humans are beautiful, but, you know, I don't really believe in evil, but evil manifests, you know, it manifests. And given the right conditions, and um, people that are attracted to power, usually have some other issues and that's why it all goes wrong. Any other questions <laughs> on a light note? <laughs> no, I've, um, yeah, no. All right. Just the pain thing that is, that you, that you can't do, you said that to you. Oh, uh, yeah, well, um, I, no, I changed it. Oh. Yeah, yeah, because it didn't I work, it. yeah, I, it, it was quite, it was almost too personal and um, it worked for me and I did, at the time I had that dream, I did a lot of sketches because the dream impacted me more than most dreams. It was really significant and I didn't know. I thought it was something to do with me not being able to make up my mind about a direction I was taking. And yet, and it probably is, you know. But what I'm trying to say is when all of what I just said matches, right? So we talked about the curves of the trees, the curves in your veins, the curves in the waterways. Um, my dream that could be applying to what was happening in Wuhan at that exact time that I dreamt it, that they were mangling in Mother Nature, pulling out her cables, the cords, you know, putting negatives to positives and screwing everything up. And, and because they, and literally, I wrote those words, they wanted to control her and she was pregnant. You know, they wanted to control life and death. And that's what I think is going on. So, you know. Maybe it's sort of, I don't know. I don't know how, how these things happen, but I do feel like that is always pulsing in us, you know, this pattern, this understanding, this. So to trust nature is, is quite difficult. You know, we drive cars and have phones and things like that, but um, you know, you can tune in, you know, look at a tree, look at its curves, put the phone in the freezer, it's square. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know, that other thing we were saying in the little thing I wrote about, uh, that Joe was reading from us, <coughs> Um, it's on um, my website and on, on Jarok's website, is that um, it's just that you, um, uh, you, everything seems overwhelming. You know, I spent a lot of time in the outback and we had, you know, like 10 years and we had no phone, no radio, no TV, nothing. It was nothing. It was only, you go to the, you know, now and again to Coober P or William Creek Pub, so there was nothing coming in like that. So, and it's quite a good life. We, it was the best years of my life. We, there was no input. So, I mean, I wasn't trying to be an artist. I was a um, yard builder and a rabbit shooter. So, you know, <laughs> I, you know, you had to deal with the man who sold the bullets. And that's so, but it, um, it's doable and you can do it now, but you just need to put the phone in the freezer. And why do you put it in the freezer? Does anyone know? So, yes, would you say? No, no, because then they can't listen, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sort of teasing. Sorry, Helen, would you say that um, each one of your paintings is a manifestation of one of your dreams, or is it a combination of? I don't know what happened in this dream, though. Yeah. <laughs> well, actually, that, um, I, I, I that, you've got to look closely there, um, see that? See, there's two alternate realities, the little working dog outside and this one. Looking, this could have been his alternate re reality. And he's saying, what's going on? And he's going, what's going on in there? <laughs> and they come to it, you know, and he's saying, oh, he's going, oh, it might have lost the difference. <laughs> 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 now, what about the cat? 
ABC uh, chap today, and we were talking about when things go wrong, and at certain points when you're painting an exhibition, it's a lot of work, you know, you're working for a long time, and yeah, you get no feedback, so you don't even know whether or not you're going down the wrong hole, and there are times when I just get stuck, like everybody, and there was a moment when I, just sharing with you a little insight, which may or um, and it was actually somewhere around this stage and I was painting and I'm thinking oh now is that animal uh, does that live in the southwest oh hang on I've got to look it up <laughs> oh no oh, I really need some red oh maybe a rose no I want something really stupid you know so it's like and it, and it was I was killing myself I was locking myself into this hole with trying to make I just lo I'd forgotten I'd forgotten how to be um, how to invent and then I I just thought stuff it I've had enough, and I um, painted the striped cow, and, um, <laughs> and, and, it, and I, I kind of got over it when I realised that I had locked myself in with reality, and um, that's boring. Oh yeah, that's my favourite. What's the story behind that one? Oh, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well, if there's any horse people in the room. <laughs> it's like, well, it's sort of that thing with the horse. You know, it's, people think they're controlling the animal, but, you know, the animal wins. It's just a, it's a very, it's just a light-hearted, um, you know, yeah, just a light-hearted yes. thing. And it kind of accidentally manifested. So sometimes <laughs> images just appear and I just, uh, I don't plan a lot of paintings. I do um, for the structure. But the content usually just appears and I just let it in. So, you know, I say, what is it that would like to come here? Ah, I can come and $5. <laughs> <laughs> so, so often that's where the contents come in by themselves. And, I, I, you know, that's just an active imagination, I think. <laughs> yeah. So, mm. yeah. Yeah. all right. Thank you very much for coming. I really appreciate it. Thank you. And for listening.